I am Daniel Lucas and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years and today I have my special guest. He is the author of several books, no other than Mr. Paul Clark. Hello, Daniel. How are you today? I'm fabulous like you, Mr. Paul. And again, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Paul Clark. I'm English. Uh, I grew up in Manchester, which I think is a very famous city all around the world. But I live now right in the south of England near the sea. Um, for a long time, I was a teacher of English as a foreign language. I lived in Italy and I lived in Thailand for a few years. Um, but then I settled down in England and I went into language school management. And then just before the pandemic, I kind of semi-retired in order to concentrate on my writing. Um, so I've written four books and today we're going to be talking about my second book, which is the second book in a trilogy. And the name of the book is A Long Night of Chaos. A Long Night of Chaos. What initial steps to begin this book? Okay, um, so the book, the trilogy was originally written as one book. Um, and then after a long time, I got an agent who helped me edit the book. And then when he finished editing it, he said, it's, it's, he liked the book very much. He said, it's a good book, but it's too long and I don't know how to sell it. So what you need to do, don't make it shorter, make it longer and turn it into a series. So eventually I turned it into a trilogy. Um, the original name of the whole book was A Long Night of Chaos. And then when I split the book up, um, the first part became The Price of Dreams and the last part became Day of the Long Knives. But the, the middle part kept the original title, A Long Night of Chaos. The title comes from a 19th century Russian writer called Alexander Herzen who I think he was writing at the time of the 1848 revolutions in Europe. And he gave a warning at that time. This is what he said. He said, the death of contemporary forms of social order ought to gladden rather than trouble the soul. But what is frightening is that the departing world leaves behind it not an heir, but a pregnant widow. Between the death of one and the birth of the other, much water will flow by, a long night of chaos and desolation will pass. So Alexander Herzen was warning that when a dictatorship falls, you don't necessarily get freedom and democracy and liberty. What you actually get between the collapse of the old order and the birth of the new order is a period of chaos. Um, and so this book is set in the period of chaos that envelops certain parts of Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, some of Eastern Europe, they didn't have this. They, they had a beautiful period and they transitioned quite quickly to democracy. They had economic collapse, but not political collapse. But other parts of Eastern Europe, such as Yugoslavia and the North Caucasus, or sorry, the South Caucasus in the Soviet Union, experienced a period of absolute political chaos and economic chaos. And it was when everything was vying with everything else, especially different ethnic groups were vying with each other for independence or for control. Um, and the mafia were stepping out of the shadows and becoming a major political force. So this novel is set during that period. Um, it's set in an imaginary Soviet Republic which is divided between three main ethnic groups. And as the Soviet Union collapses and communist dictatorship collapses, the three main ethnic groups start trying to disentangle themselves from each other. The problem is that they live in a mishmash. It's not as if you've got one ethnic group living here, another ethnic group living here, another one living here, and they can easily separate. They're all mishmashed together. And the only way they can separate is either by negotiation or by war. And the war, if it happens, would be a very bloody war because it would involve 
people driving members of the other ethnic groups out of their villages and towns, um, which is what happened in Yugoslavia. Uh, the, the word ethnic cleansing was born and the Serbs in particular drove Croats and Bosnian Muslims out of their homes. Uh, the Croats drove Serbs in certain areas out of their homes. Um, and you had a similar thing in places like Georgia between the Abkhazians and the Georgians and the Ossetians and the Georgians. You had it in Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which is still not finished, where they've been driving each other out of their homes. So this is the, the period that the novel is set in. Interesting, uh, Mr. Paul. So what techniques can help in developing compelling and believable characters in a long night of chaos? I think the first the first thing was to think about the setting. So I spent a long time inventing an imaginary country and I wrote that country's history for myself, going back to the times of the ancient Greeks, right up to modern times. Um, and then I imagined my central character who uh, comes from a nationalistic family. His, his father was a, uh, a Soviet partisan during the Second World War who fought against another ethnic group which collaborated with the Germans and um, who was quite anti-communist as well. His mother was very nationalistic and anti-communist um, and he ended up marrying a woman from a different ethnic group. And his family were not altogether happy about him marrying this woman from a different ethnic group, but they accepted it in the end. I think she charmed them um, and they they were very happy with, with her as his wife. So my next thing was to think about a believable character. My, my character was based on a number of people. One it was based on a Croatian policeman whose name was Josip Rihil Kerr. He was a policeman in Croatia, which was then part of Yugoslavia, when Yugoslavia was falling apart. And in the area that he controlled as a police chief, there were Serbian villages and Croatian villages. And these people were armed to the teeth and they were getting ready to attack each other. And what Joseph Riegel Kerr did was he traveled between the villages and he arranged ceasefires between them. He sort of said, okay, you control this area up to this bridge. And then after this bridge, you control this area, you control this forest, these farms you control, these farms you control. And they signed treaties between the different villages. And, and he went around doing that. So my central character is in a way based on him. But also when I was living in Thailand, um, this is back in the 1980s, I remember a boxer, I can't remember his name, he won the first ever gold, no, he won the first ever silver medal in the Olympics by a Thai athlete. And when he came home, he was such a national hero. And I remember all the political leaders of Thailand were lining up to be photographed next to him because he was such a hero to Thai people. So my central character became an Olympic hero. He became someone who had won a medal in the Olympic Games and was a national hero. Because he was married to a member of another ethnic group, he was popular among that ethnic group as well. And so he is uniquely positioned to try and do what Joseph Rihil Kerr did in Croatia, try and arrange ceasefires between different ethnic groups within his country. Um, at the start of the book, he's living abroad in England um, and a leading communist contacts him and begs him to come home and use his influence as a very popular celebrity among different ethnic groups to try and stop the war. Um, and so that's what he does. He comes home and he's going between villages where people are armed to the teeth and very, very nervous and he's approaching the roadblocks with his hands up and saying, come on, let's talk. Let's arrange for negotiations between you and the next village 
to give the politicians upstairs time to sort things out so that we can do whatever we're going to do. Everybody gets to keep their rights and we don't have a civil war. That's what he's trying to do in the book. Very well said, Mr. Paul. But before we go on, I want to shout out my listeners in Turkey. Because in Istanbul, I got 52% audience. Trabazona 28, Guamashan, Ankara, or Ankara, Koseli, Gazinan Tap, or Manisa, Anta, Antalya, and many more. Thank you, Turkey, for supporting this podcast. Is, Istanbul is one of my favorite cities. Wow. <laughs> It's a beautiful city. I, I used to go there on business quite often, and mm -hmm. I used to go to Kadikoy and to Iskital Street. Which yes. are really marvelous areas. I like them very much. The buildings are so are so fabulous, most especially their most. Thank you, Turkey, for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created in power writers, authors all over the world, like Mr. Paul Clark. So, Mr. Paul, what are the effective ways to build a plot that keeps the readers engaged from beginning to end? Uh, you have to, I, I think the best way to do it is to go for a three-act plot. So you've got act one of the plot, uh, which is normal life and takes you through to the inciting incident, the moment when things start to happen. And then act two gets more and more and more exciting. There'll be a twist partway through act two to a climax, and then act three brings it down from the climax. In this book, In a Long Night of Chaos, uh, I go wham, straight in, uh, with a major incident when a significant character is shot. And we start with that. And then we go back in time to get the background to what's happening. And then the stakes are raised and raised and raised again. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers, um, but One major character is shot and survives, and another major character is shot and doesn't survive. And so the stakes are getting higher and higher as things go on, um, because my central character and his team are trying to stop a war, but he's not sure about one member of his team who's a leading communist. He doesn't understand what this communist is up to. And the fact that the communist is is using him to try and help the communists get back to power. Um, and there are other people who don't want to stop the war. There are people who very much want to have a civil war because they see it as a way to power. Yeah, If they can have their civil war, they can win the war and they can use their victory to gain power within their country. And then there are mafia types who are also involved, and what they basically want is a civil war because that's a way to get plunder. Um, and they're, they're looking forward to plundering the enemy. When they drive them from their villages, they'll go in and plunder their houses. So I raise the stakes constantly, and the stakes are very, very high indeed as the book goes on. How can you ensure that a long night of chaos themes is clearly communicated and impactful. Yeah, it's it's quite difficult, I think, because it is a complex plot. Um, people have said, reviewers have said, it's like reading about real events, which it is because I based quite a lot of the events on things that really happened in Yugoslavia in, in particular. Um, you have to keep repeating yourself. I think to a certain extent, you know, when a new character is introduced, you've got to say who that character is. And then if that character goes away for a long time and then comes back, you have to remind the reader who that character is. I, I read a spy story not long ago, which was a good book. I enjoyed it very much. But there was a character who appeared at the beginning and then appeared at the end. And I had no idea who this character was. And I, I wanted the author to to just remind me who this character was. And in the end, I went back to about chapter four to see who the character was. So what I kept trying to do was when a character 
disappeared and then came back a bit later to remind the reader just who that character is to help the reader to to know what was going on. Indeed, Mr. Paul. So in what ways can dialogue be used to reveal character and advance the plot? You know, I, I the... use dialogue a lot in my writing. Um, and very often when complex events are happening, it's quite difficult to describe the events. So it's much easier just to have someone talk about the events. Uh, and in that sense, you can use dialogue to make quite complex events happen without boring the reader, um, just with an explanation of what's going on. So I, I think dialogue helps a lot with that. And with character, it's through dialogue that people reveal their character. And you can see my central character, he's not always 100% honest. You know, he, he will he will do one thing and he'll say he's done another thing from time to time. And I hope that's revealing aspects of his character. He'll say one thing to one person and something slightly different to another person. Um, and again, he's revealing aspects of his character in that way. He's not perfect. You know, he, he he's human like the rest of us. He's a good guy, but he's not a perfect guy. He's not a saint. And he's he's not a, a he's a willing to do a little bit of skullduggery now and then, and why not? Why not? Yes. Before we go on, Mr. Clark, I'm uh, inviting our listeners to please do purchase my bestseller audiobooks. Bestsellers, people, stand tall, stand together, and of course, my book one hundred one review, volume three. This is the product of my. Uh, First season, 100 episodes. There are three volumes now, people. Book 101, Review Volume 3. Um, suggestions, Book 101, Review Volume 2, Selected. And Book 101, Review Volume 1, Highly Recommended. And, of course, my Earth, Earth Fever, Unraveling Climate and Our Race. And our race to restore balance, people, for my climate change book. And, of course, my self-help book, Life is Too Short, A Journey of Discovery, Fulfillment and Joy, and Threads of Existence, A History of Life, and available on Audible, people. So please do purchase one of my bestsellers, Audio Book, at Rolls, thus research play enhancing the authenticity of your book. Uh, I did a lot of research for this book. Um, I should think I probably read 20 books in order to write this book. Uh, books about Eastern Europe, books about Yugoslavia. Um, and I think it paid off. I, When I finished the book, I sent out a lot of unsolicited copies of the book to other writers. And one of the people I sent it out to is a guy called Neil Asherson. And Neil Asherson is one of my heroes. He's a Scottish reporter. And he's a reporter who spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe at around this time, around the time of the collapse of communism. And he's really an expert on Eastern Europe. And I sent a copy to the, of the book to him and he liked it. And he sent me a nice letter back saying how much he liked the book, and he gave me something that I could use as a quotation on the back of the book, uh, on the blurb, to, to recommend the book. And then he penned a little note to me. He said, what about you? What's your background? How come you've got such a good feel for the region? And I thought, wow, to have Neil Asherson say this to me means I've done my research. And, you know, I, I did it well. The other thing I would say is when I did my research, eventually I decided to make up my own country. And when you make up your own country, it's great because you can take a little bit from this country and a little bit from that country and mix it all together and, and do it your way. So I invented a language for them where I took the grammar from Georgian and I took the vocabulary from Ingushetian with a little bit of Russian mixed in and invented a language, hey presto. Um, 
and I, I had things like when uh, a young woman goes to meet her boyfriend's parents for the first time, she takes some flour and some salt. And I thought, yeah, that can be part of their culture. And it, it is the culture somewhere in Eastern Europe. I can't remember which country it was in Eastern Europe, but there's one country in Eastern Europe where you do that, where you go to meet your in-laws for the first time or your future in-laws for the first time. You take them a gift of flour and salt. So I, I threw that in, you know, and I threw little things like that in to, to the book to try and get a, a feel for the region. Very well said, Mr. Paul. So in Long Night of Chaos, how do you balance between being original and appealing to genre expectations? Um, I think in terms of genre, I'm a little bit outside genre. Uh, my, my agent called my book a semi-literary novel, that it wasn't your, it's a thriller about politics, but it's not a political thriller. When you do a political thriller, uh, generally speaking, you have an innocent person who uncovers a vast conspiracy. That's what most political thrillers are about. This is not about that. It's about something different. So I went outside the genre a little bit. Um, there's aspects of thriller which are within the genre. Um, the villain, you know, there, there's a villain who, who's a psychopath who hates the central character. He's in book one as well, and he comes, he reappears in book two and book three. Um, then other characters are quite loosely based on real historical characters. So one of the big political villains is loosely based on Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia. Um, and quite a few readers have, have picked it up. They've realized that, ah, this guy is Slobodan Milosevic. So I stepped outside genre a little bit, and I was quite happy to do that. Is it worth it, Mr. Paul, to go outside from the genre? It? Yes. <laughs> is it worth it? Um, I gained a lot of pleasure re writing the book. Uh, I wrote the book that I wanted to write, um, and some readers have gained a lot of pleasure reading the book. Uh, one one reader said she found it inspirational. Um, so yeah, for me it's definitely worth it. Definitely. Financially, financially maybe not. <laughs> so how can authors effectively market their book to reach their okay, target audiences? Marketing your book is the hard part. True. Um, it's. <laughs> I think um, Tom Wolf said any idiot can write a book. It takes a genius to get one published. And I think then you've got to say it takes a genius to get one sold as well. So number one, when you're marketing a book, you have to look at the cover. And that is a key thing about the cover. And your cover has to fit within genre. So I spent a lot of time looking at political thrillers and what kind of cover political thrillers have. And as a whole, political thrillers are blue. That's the dominant cover color of the cover of a political thriller. And on the whole, political thrillers will have a figure in silhouette. And generally speaking, if the figure in silhouette is running towards you, um, then that is a detective thriller. And if the figure in silhouette is running away from you, that's a political thriller. In my case, I decided to have the figure, the, fig the silhouette just standing there amid the chaos. Other things, political thrillers, the the typeface is quite a bold, masculine typeface. And at the time I did the cover, the most common color for political thrillers was white, that the, the writing would be white. I think the fashion has actually changed in the last couple of years, and it's now quite common to have red. So I, I'm kind of thinking, should I go back to my designer and get red writing rather than white writing? So, you know, your your cover. People say you shouldn't judge a book by your cover. Well, everybody does. Yes. So get a <laughs> cover which you're happy with and which sells your book. Second thing you have to work on is the blurb. Um, and the blurb has to have a hook to pull the reader in and then has to persuade the reader to keep the reader there 
and to make them want to read the book. And then the third thing I think is is social media. You have to do a lot of work on social media. So I do work on Twitter. I do work on my Facebook page promoting my books. Um, I probably should do more on Facebook. I don't spend enough time on Facebook groups. There's a lot of groups on Facebook. Um, the other thing you have to do is you have to get your book reviewed. Yes. So all of my books have been reviewed by the online book club. So it's a bit risky because you pay a bit of money and they review your book and they give it an honest review. If they don't like it, they're going to say they don't like it. Um, <laughs> and fortunately, my reviewers who I paid for on online book club, they all like my books. Okay. And I got four out of four, four stars. Um, I think they've gone to five stars now. And recently I got five out of five stars for one of my books. But then when you get that review, you can use that review to sell your book. Um, there are charlatans out there who will review your book and will give it a five-star review without even reading it. And you should steer clear of those people. There's another one. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but they're where authors review each other's books. There's a website where authors will review each other's books and give each other five stars. And, you know, I think that's corrupt. <laughs> and I don't want to go there. It's not I honest. want people <laughs> to review my book and give an honest review. There are places where people will give an honest review of your book. And you take a risk. You know, they might not like it. And you have to hope that they do do like it. Um, another thing you can do is you can go on podcasts and try and talk about your book on podcasts. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Just like this podcast, because yeah. this is this podcast is great to empower you. Mr. Paul, so my last question is, how does one handle your criticism and use it um, constructively? Okay, criticism hurts. Yes. When when you Truly get hurts. criticized, um I had one experience where um my fourth book, the first draft of it, I sent it to an editor and she sent it back with a long list of criticisms. And it really hurt. I'd spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, put my soul into that book. And she came back and said, you've got to do it. She said, there's good bits, but you've got to do a lot more work before it's ready. And it really hurt. And it was weeks before I could bring myself to, yeah. to deal with it. And eventually I dealt with it and read her criticisms. And I kind of agreed with 80% of them. She was, I think 20%, she was wrong. And I didn't agree with that. That's fine. But 80% I did agree with, and I used that criticism to, to make the book better. All of my books have been out to beta readers. So beta readers are friends or friends of friends or better strangers who will agree to read your book and say what they think of it. And when they come back with criticisms, um, generally my beta readers have liked my books, but I've had some very good beta readers who have given me very good ideas and very good constructive criticisms and it can hurt and you've got to take it on the chin and listen to it yes because <laughs> you know you want to write a book that people will want to read that's yes. that's the important thing there's no good writing a book that nobody's going to want to read so you take it on the chin you listen to it and then you go back to it yes people Criticism or feedback is good for you to make you better, excellent in the future. But before we go on, Mr. Paul, please, I'm inviting you to please do listen to my other podcast, Food 101, our fourth season with Chef Alessandro, one of the uh, executive chef in one of the five-star restaurants in downtown Toronto. So please do listen food 101 and of course our books are out not only one but 13 volumes people food 101 volume one basics until 13 is only the books that you need how to create a delicious food available on amazon and leading online bookstores world 
white. So, Mr. Paul, a long night of chaos. What will be your hope? Um, my hope is people will read the book and enjoy the book. And I, I hope people are inspired by the central character. Um, he is he's a flawed. He's not perfect. He gets things wrong. He makes mistakes. But he's a good guy. And he's trying to secure peace rather than war. I hope people can see one of the things he says is people from different ethnic groups don't need to be afraid of each other, but sometimes they need to listen to each other. And there's maybe one or two places in the world where if only people from different groups could listen to each other, then things might get a bit better. Um, so I, I hope people find him an inspiring figure, but I also hope they, they enjoy the read. And, you know, it, it's a thrill. It's a roller coaster ride. Um, there's ups and there's downs, and I, I hope people can enjoy the ups and the downs as well. Yes, people, let's support Mr. P Mr. Paul Clark, because if you support him, more, more, more books to come. So, Mr. Paul, can you please invite our listeners to support all your books? Okay, so A Long Night of Chaos is part of a trilogy of books. Um, they're called the Ruslan Shinitsa Novels, because the hero's name is Ruslan Shinitsa. And they are about a young man under communism, who's trying to maintain his integrity without selling out to the communists, something he finds very difficult because he's also very ambitious. And then the, the books follow him into the period of chaos that followed the collapse of communism and the Soviet Union. As they're written so that you can read any one of them without reading the others. So you can jump straight into the second book, you can jump straight into the third book, or you can start at the first book and go all the way through. It's up to you. Um, they are books, I think, to a certain extent, they're character-driven. Um, the character, people who've reviewed the book have described him as a very likable character, someone who they root for. They really care about him, and they hope that he's going to succeed in what he's trying to do. Um, and it's also a book which is set in a particular time and a particular place, a fictional place, not a true historical place. And I hope that it can give you an idea about that time and place. Then my fourth novel is very different. My fourth novel is set in England, and it's a story of a young man who kills somebody in a traffic accident, or he causes a traffic accident in which another driver is killed. And it's about him falling apart and trying to find a way through it, through what he's done. So that book is called The Omega Course. Very well said, Mr. Paul, and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Mr. Paul, thank you for your time.